if we want a future that's equitable, how do we make this technology safe and available to the most amount of people possible? And nobody's really thinking about that question. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to the Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. This week, our guest is Josiah Sainer, who might just be the most prominent and controversial biohacker that is out there right now. He's done numerous experiments that have drawn both positive and negative attention his way such as transplanting the microbiome of another person into his own body, attempting to genetically alter the color of his skin, and injecting CRISPR modifications into his body to enhance his muscles. As radical as these things may sound, Josiah does have a PhD in biophysics, and he previously worked for NASA genetically modifying organisms for Mars. So he's not exactly an amateur, So in this episode, what we do is explore Josiah's journey from traditional scientist to biohacker. And along the way, we discuss the possibilities of gene editing, the dangers, and how we might regulate and navigate this technology that is rapidly changing the world. Now, if you are interested in discussing similar topics with like-minded peers as well, be sure to check the links in the episode description where you'll find out how to join our free community where conversations like this are taking place every day. But for now, let's go ahead and get into this conversation. So everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Josiah Sainer. We're just going to start at the beginning, as all good stories should, um, which really, I think, should be the fact that you originally took a very traditional and what many would consider like a successful path. You had your PhD in biophysics. You started working for NASA, modifying organisms for life on Mars, which sounds incredibly badass. But then all of a sudden, you stopped doing that and you decided to do something that is much more non-traditional. You start moving into the realm of biohacking. What motivated that transition for you? You know, uh, when I first started in academia, well, I did a master's degree and then I went into my PhD. And during my PhD, there was nothing more that I dreamed of than like being a academic professor or scientist. I mean, that's kind of what they train you to do. You know, it's like a system that is meant to spit out academic professors, obviously. Like you can't become an academic professor any other way than by like getting a PhD. Um, The problem is, is that very few people actually wind up with academic professorships, but they are trying to convince everybody that like, oh, you know, you're gonna be an academic professor or like go work towards being an academic professor, which isn't necessarily the worst thing. And not saying that I couldn't have been an academic professor, but what I saw was that these people just like, once you move up the ranks, you do less and less science and you spend more and more time just grant writing or writing papers or doing things that are just like, not what a scientist should be doing. And it's crazy because what'll happen is at the peak of your career, you get your PhD, you do a postdoc, you know, you've published a bunch of papers by that point that, you know, are you know, generally really good science if you're getting a professorship. And then you're just supposed to like give that all up and you're just supposed to not do like science anymore. You're just supposed to, you know, basically be an administrator or manager or or, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, that's that's awfully disheartening to, to realize is that like this thing that you love, you know, a lot of people going to graduate school do it because they love science because like, Who's going to suffer through six years of bullshit and like, you know, just because like nobody. And then like nowadays, three to six years of like a postdoc getting paid like 40 or $50,000 a year. Like who's going to do that unless you at least somewhat love the science. I just started to cut you off, but I just turned down a PhD because I learned all of these things and it was so disheartening to me. Just like you said, it was like, six six or seven years of study six years of postdoc 
and then you have to fight for the one percent of positions that are available yeah. and you have to follow wherever that job takes you to so you don't even get to choose where you live oh yeah no i have friends who are in like crazy places and they're just like oh man that sucks you know you got a professorship at some place you know not not like a bad place or something like that but like who really wants to live in like Bloomington, Indiana or something, you know, or like, that's, that's about <laughs> where I grew up. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in Valparaiso actually. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know. I would rather live near a big city, but then getting a professorship at a university that's near, near a big city or something like that is extremely difficult. And, uh, you know, you're, even though scientists are like, oh, we have so much freedom, we we can research whatever we want. They can't. They're stuck researching things that they can get grants for or that are publishable. You know, it's like all the cool science that we all want to see doesn't happen, right? Like we sometimes we read about it and everybody like calls a person crazy, but like nobody's like cutting heads off of monkeys and trying to put them on like horses and stuff like that. Or, like sewing monkey arms on like frogs, like all the weird stuff is like totally taboo and like science won't fund it or you can't do it and all this stuff. And it's like, wait, I thought that was like the point of science is like you get to this place where you can do all this cool stuff, right? You can try to make like a frog grow wings or like, you know, all this weird stuff that we read about in science fiction. Like everybody wants to do that stuff, but like nobody's actually doing it. That was just like... Did you feel those same restrictions at NASA then? Well, I'll get to that in a sec. Oh, sure. So, yeah. So it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, like everybody says they can research what they want. And when you ask them, you know, are you researching what they want? They're like, yeah. And then you're like, what are you researching? And they're like fruit fly sex or something. And you're like, nobody actually wants to research that. Come on. Like there's zero people in the world. If you give them a choice, here's like a billion dollars, research whatever you want. Would they choose fruit fly sex? No, they'd be like, I want to make like X-Men or something. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, I'm going to leave academia. And uh, it was actually, you know, I was at a conference and I was presenting research and there was somebody for NASA there and they were like, you should apply for this grant that we have. Um, it'll give you some money and all this stuff and you'll be able to research stuff for NASA and do all this stuff. And I was like, Oh, you know, that's uh that sounds pretty crazy. Like I'll apply. Um so I wrote this like, you know, 20 page grant proposal about some crazy stuff like I'm going to go on Mars and like build structures using like light controlled organisms and enzymes and all this other stuff from the Martian soil. Um and uh, they were like, "All right, we'll fund it." And I was like, "What?" That <laughs> It was pretty surreal and weird because you think like most times people talk about like, I'm going to build a, a house on Mars. It's like in jest. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're actually researching towards doing that. And so it was kind of uh, even writing it, you know, you're like laughing. You're like, I'm going to use this to build a house on Mars or something. I'm going like to submit just... this to smart people and they're going to like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're gonna think i'm crazy like yeah. <laughs> who wouldn't think somebody was crazy if they wrote something like that you'd be like uh-huh sure you are sure you're gonna build houses on mars buddy um but it worked and uh i wound up at nasa and i was just like wow this is this is crazy this is awesome i met nasa and <laughs> work with all these scientists who um do experiments and have stuff on the international space station um what you quit quickly come to realize is that like not only is nasa like it's still the government people don't understand that i think is that like even though they try to pretend like they're not the government they still are and so everything is super bureaucratic and everything takes super long right um and so you're just kind of like oh gosh like we're stuck in this crazy bureaucratic hole where like you say i'm gonna like I'm going to work on a robot that's going to swim in the lakes of Europa or the hydrocarbon lakes of Europa. But like, when's the last time we even set anything even close to Europa? Like 10 years ago, when's the next time we're going to send something there? Like in another 30 years? And so basically your stuff on there competing. With yeah, else. exactly. So basically what you're doing is just like some 
mental masturbation exercise, which is like fun, but like it doesn't get you anywhere. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, uh, I wanted to actually do real world stuff that might have been a little crazy, um, but just push the boundaries of what, you know, people thought was, uh, how do you say, acceptable science. So that jumped you into the biohacking, but what was the first thing that you started doing with the biohacking? Like, what was the impetus there that made you think, all right, I want to work on this project specifically? Yeah, it was actually with CRISPR because at NASA, I was working with CRISPR a little bit. And um, I remember reading the papers that came out about CRISPR and, you know, they were like, oh, you know, you got this like PAM sequence and this tracer RNA and this CR RNA and you got Cas9 and you got all this stuff, you know, the NGG, it depends on which strand it's on. It was just like so convoluted. It was just like crazy. Um, I was just like, what this is so hard to understand why isn't there just like a simple guide for somebody to understand it finally when i understood it at least to a certain extent i was like this really isn't that complicated it's just like nobody's presenting it in easily digestible manner um and i was like this is actually really simple stuff right you got your cas9 enzyme right that binds a piece of rna now we call it a guide rna that contains the cr rna and the tracer rna and that binds a dna sequence and the cas9 enzyme cuts the dna sequence and you could make a genetic change if you want or a genetic change happens because you cut it and i was like wow it's really simple all you have to do is like put this cas9 enzyme and the guide rna that targets a specific piece of dna into a cell and CRISPR happens, right? It genetically modifies an organism. And, you know, CRISPR is like one of the most hyped genetic technique, genetic engineering techniques right now. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was. Do you think it's overhyped or do you think the hype is warranted? I mean, everything's overhyped, yeah. you know? <laughs> what, well, what are, the, what are the limitations with CRISPR? Like a lot of people think when you talk about this kind of stuff that, you could do something to an adult person, like start changing their arm to like a gecko arm or something. But from my understanding, you know, there's a lot of limitations, especially on people who are already like alive. You can do stuff uh, in fertilization or in vitro or whatever, but on adult humans, for example, it's much more difficult to actually change like real, to kind of the, do the superhuman kind of stuff totally. that people like to think about. But what is that limitation slash Yeah, you have to think about that, like, as adults, like, we've already structurally formed our bodies, right? Not 100%, right? But, like, generally, we structurally formed our bodies. So, like, all embryos, um, all embryos, no matter what organism, generally start out in the same body patterning thing, right? So all, you know, uh, animals and they move through these stages. Well, like the first two stages of embryogenesis, like very, very similar. If you looked at pictures, you might not even be able to tell the difference between like what animal it was. Right. But then the body starts telling the genes and everything start telling the body what to do, right? Like grow a tail or grow two arms or grow this or grow that. Um, And that's when, you know, the body axes and everything starts to differentiate and turn into stuff. Um, Now, it's not to say that like adults, you couldn't grow stuff. You definitely can, right? There's adult animals that they can regenerate limbs and things like that. Um, It's just figuring out how to do that. Generally, what I like to think of with science is like what's possible and what's probable. And Right now, the probability of, say, like growing an extra limb in an adult human is pretty small. Is it possible? Totally. Like, we know we can grow limbs. We know other animals can grow limbs once they're chopped off, even as adults. It's just understanding how all those mechanisms go into play and how to, like, recapitulate that in an adult human, um, which will probably be a while. So generally, adults right now, we're limited to modifications that a little goes a long way. Right. And by that, I mean, like, um, you know, generally like metabolic things or things like that, they're usually targeting something when they do gene therapies where like, if you make a little bit of changes, it'll like help you 
you know, use an enzyme to help process something or something like that. Um, even things like muscular dystrophy, they're trying to catch it before the children are like two. So then they can still influence kind of like the structural integrity of the body. Um, so they're not like too old, even though you still might have some effect, it's just, but whatever. Um, but like, you know, as, as an older adult, it's, uh, it's kind of limited in terms of like serious changes, like phenotypic changes. And are you focused I mean, in your personal experiment, since you are an adult and you're using yeah. your own body, obviously you're focusing more on those types of changes, but like, what are some of the changes that you think are going to happen in that area that you think are possible that are maybe not being explored? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, there've been a number of papers, um, that have shown gene therapies work in different things. So one of them is, uh, like I think you mentioned is, uh, you know, myostatin. Generally, they try to knock down the, the effect of the myostatin gene. So myostatin is this gene that generally like reduces your muscle mass because like if you constantly make muscle, you know, normal animal bodies aren't built for that. It consumes a lot of calories and stuff like that. So it helps regulate. So you have like a reasonable amount of muscle. Um, but there's this gene called folostatin, which inhibits myostatin. Um, so there are gene therapies that have been developed and worked on that involve folostatin to reduce the amount of myostatin in your, in your body and bloodstream. And there have been some with like a Becker muscular dystrophy that have shown that like when you inject the legs of these people with muscular dystrophy adults, you can increase the ambulatory distance. So like how far they can walk, right. Which is like, wow, that's great. Like, you know, like there's an effect on, people's actual muscle. Like they can walk further after they get this musk, you know, gene therapy in their legs. Um, but like these things, they cost money, you know, finding the people to be involved in the clinical trials, finding correct cohorts so that you could get your clinic, your clinical trial approved because clinical trials aren't experiments, right? You don't invest a billion dollars in an experiment. No, you go in like, it's going to work. This, drug is going to work or else like our company's going bust. Um, and there've been other ones, um, with EPO, you know, EPO is what a lot of cyclists and other people have used to dope. It's actually a gene, um, a little protein, and you can do a gene therapy that'll increase the EPO in, in your bloodstream. And obviously, uh, that increases, um, the oxygenation, and, and stuff like that. And VEGF, which is a protein that in increases, um, like the amount, uh, of veins that grow in different tissue. They have tested out in diabetics, you know, cause diabetics will tend to have like lack of blood flow to the extremities. Um, and there's all these things that have tested that we know at least have a chance of working, um, that we could use that we could try. And that's like one of the big things that motivated you, right, is the fact that there's a lot of stuff we could try that we aren't trying. So can you talk a little bit about like maybe what the regulatory landscape is for like things like CRISPR and how you feel about making these technologies like open to the masses to start just playing with these tools? Uh, yeah, it's, it's really crazy, you know, um, and it's really controversial. And I don't know if you've heard about it, but, you know, uh, mid like 2020, me and a couple other people worked on a DIY COVID vaccine, um, which was a gene therapy. A lot of these new COVID vaccines are gene therapies. Um, essentially, they're putting genes into your cells that make this viral spike protein. And when your cells make the viral spike protein, then your cells have an immune response to the spike protein and you develop antibodies. So instead of like what they do with some vaccines is they'll like, you know, inactivate a virus and inject it in. So it, the proteins are there or like try to create the protein separately and inject that in. But people are learning that maybe this gene therapy works better, probably for some host of immunological reasons, the presenting of the, the protein to your immune system and how your immune system recognizes it and stuff like that. Um, and we did, you know, pretty rigorous testing on this. We tested it in human cells. Um, previously to what, when we started, it was actually tested in monkeys and shown to work in monkeys. And so we were like, 
you know, let's, why wouldn't it work in humans? Let's give it a shot. Um, and so we tested in human cells, then we tested our antibodies and we tested our ability of our antibodies to neutralize the virus. So we did a bunch of tests on it after we injected ourselves with two doses. Um, and it seemed to work. All of our bodies seemed to have developed a, uh, an immune response and uh, a viral neutralizing immune response. Um, now, gosh, something like that, you know, especially this is before vaccines were even being distributed. We're talking, we ordered, the paper came out in May, 2020. We ordered the vaccine, had it manufactured. Um, and uh, we, we received it probably in like July of 2020. Um, and then we, you know, ran through all these experiments because um, we wanted to do it the right way and just not, you know, I'm injecting myself with this and <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> um, and so we probably finished up, I think we finished up around September of 2020. Um, and, uh, you know, most people didn't get their vaccines until, you know, February, March of 2021 or later. Mm-hmm. Um, now recently within the past few weeks or month, India has said that they're using the same exact COVID vaccine we did, wow. right? A DNA vaccine that encodes for the spike protein, right? And humans, and, and you're just like, holy shit, man. You know, like we tested this thing out over a year ago. And like, if, if people's lives, I mean, people's lives are on the line, mm-hmm. but like, if more lives are on the line, like what is it going to take for the regulatory system to be like, look, we can't wait a year to distribute a vaccine to people. You know, if this pandemic was worse than it was, if it, instead of killing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, it killed hundreds of millions or tens of millions of people. Like we can't wait that long. That's just ridiculous. You know, like who's going to wait that long. Right. And so we have to figure out a way to allow quicker, innovative science to happen. You know, how many lives have been saved in India? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe, I I would think maybe some. Do you think a lot of people would have the the know-how to really do that kind of work though? Like the people who are maybe, let's say, ordering the CRISPR kits that I think you sell? No, I mean, Um, I don't don't encourage people to like (laughs) do a DNA vaccine. Well, you know, if their life's at stake, what about like less serious things? So let's say something that's not like life threatening. What do you think about like the regulations around stuff that is more, I, I would say kind of playful, right? Like not, not necessarily playful the stuff that you did with like the gut biome yeah. Yeah, thing. Yeah, I think sure. that's very serious and huge for somebody's health. Um, but like just pure experimentation, how much space should we make for people to just play with these technologies? I don't know. You know, I might piss people off when I say this, but like my body, my choice, you know, like, I think I think people uh, don't see body autonomy as like a a holistic thing, you know. Obviously, abortion is a very important thing, but like I think body autonomy encompasses a lot of different things. It's mm-hmm. not just abortion, right? And like I should have that choice over my body. Like I should be able to decide what I put into it, right? And like. I should be able to get medical care if I put something into it that maybe hurts me or something like that. I should be able to have doctors who work with me to try to put stuff in my body. Like, I think the thing is, is it's like, once you start outlawing it, you push it into the underground, right? And that's a lot of people's arguments with abortion is like, people are going to try to get abortions, you know, not safe ways if you start pushing it into the underground or outlawing it. And so like, keep it legal so that at least you can give people proper medical care and attention and, and, and stuff like that. And I think it's the same way, like medical doctors and medical professionals aren't allowed to experiment, right? They can't just be like, you're sick and you're dying. Let's try something crazy. No, there's like a list of things that they can do that the FDA says they can prescribe and do. And that's it. You think we probably need both kinds, right? We need space for people to play kind of dangerously and then let them be caught by the people who are playing by the rules. Totally. Like, here's the thing is that like, number one, like I don't want my Advil to be like contaminated or like, 
you know, have a risk of dying from it, right? So some amount of regulation is definitely good, especially on mass produced drugs that there's not a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think some amount of risk needs to be baked into the system. Whereas right now we're like, you know, if you kill somebody in a clinical trial, it's, it's terrible. You know, especially you look at like this coronavirus stuff, you're like, you know, how many, and it's a tough question, but you have to ask people like, how much is a human life worth, right? Is it worth sacrificing one person in a clinical trial so that we would have saved 500,000 lives for, from the coronavirus? Most people might say, yeah, as long as it's not me. <laughs> it's kind of a trolley problem, right? Yeah. But like, I think we can all agree. There's a number, right? If you say like, is it worth sacrificing one person to uh, from killing everybody on earth? Yeah. I, I don't mean, think anybody's that, that can make a good argument that says like, no, that's not good. No, yeah. like wiping out the human race is, you know, the worst thing that could happen. It doesn't matter anything else after that. I'd be so that we, one person just because of how badass it would be <laughs> just to save the entire planet, you know? So we have a number and then you start thinking like, how big is that number? You know, is it like the whole earth? What about half the earth? Is it worth risking one person's life? Half the earth? You're probably like, yeah, that's probably still pretty good. That's a lot of people. You know, we're talking billions of people. Then you start trying to work that number down and you're like, what is the limit? Like, where do we go? And I'm not the one who wants to make that decision, but realistically, that's what the FDA bioethicists and all these people are for. Mm -hmm. They need to make these decisions. Like what's the risk reward for this thing. Right. And we're going to have to make this decision on like how fast we can push this through because, you know, maybe we could have saved a ton of lives if we just had said, all right, this vaccine's available. It's untested. So like take it at your own risk, but like, we're going to figure out if it works. Generally, it should be mostly safe. Let's go with it and just see what happens. I think a lot of people would have been more trusting. A lot of people would have been willing to take it, um, you know, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's where our future needs to go is have some sort of risk reward analysis for medical treatment. What about things like with pathogens? I know that's like the I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this because I think when everybody thinks about CRISPR or like gene editing, the fear they all have is frankly something like COVID where they're going to do like some gain of functioning thing in our garage. It's going to get out in that like 25 year old who got a CRISPR kit releases like the next pandemic. Like what about regulations there or what's even really possible there with something like CRISPR or with biohacking for that matter? Oh, for sure. I mean, there's definitely one day going to be, I mean, if COVID was, it wasn't I'm not saying yet. whether it was or wasn't, <laughs> you know, but there's definitely going to be some biological terrorist attack. I mean, there have been, right? Um, just much smaller and, and, and dumb stuff. I think uh, there was that one cult in um, the Northwest of the United States that like sprayed a bunch of food in like a buffet with like, I forget. E. coli or something like that and got a bunch of people sick. Um, and uh, these things do happen and they're going to happen like for sure, a hundred percent. But like, I think the bigger question is, is number one, like why would you want to do a biological attack? Right? Like if I want to hurt people, right? Like I have a whole, you can turn a pressure cooker into a bomb, right? Why would I learn bioengineering to create, some bio terrorist attack that's going to be really hard to like figure out if it works right because you can't just be like i made a couple mutations in sars cov1 and it became sars cov2 you got to test it right who are you going to test it on you're going to be like kidnapping people and testing on them i guess maybe you could do some animal experiments and guinea pigs or something and then hope it works in humans but it might not also and you got to have a lot of money so we're talking like you know straight up comic book villain you're becoming in order to do this right which may happen it may happen but uh but anything like that could happen at that point with almost anything you can make a nuclear warhead at that point yeah so it's just kind of like biological biology doesn't have intent right 
So like if I get a bacteria and I'm growing it or something like that, it has no intent. Like the person who's trying to make the bad thing has intent, right? And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to just stop bad people from doing bad things. You're not necessarily trying to, you know, biology is in, in and of itself like safe. You're not going to accidentally make a ecological disaster. Like you have to think about the search space of like a genome, let's say, right? So let's say a bacteria, um, you know, they're generally like 3 billion bases or, or something like that. And in order to like, let's say, make it pathogenic and pH stable so it can like spread and do all this stuff, you have to make exact mutations in its genome, right? Let's say like five exact mutations in 3 billion base pair genome. And the chances of that happening on accident are just like so astronomical that it takes like the history of the, the earth, which it has, right? And we've had some of these viruses and bacteria evolve over the history of the earth, but you're talking like billions of bacteria and billions of years. So like the chances for that to happen accidentally are like not really high. So somebody has to have intent basically. And then once you get to that place of intent, you're like, all right, are these DNA synthesis companies, you know, protecting from people ordering this stuff. Some of them are, some of them aren't, but that's like a government thing, right? What are the other things that governments are doing to prevent this from happening? And it's like, eh, you know, not really much, but like the level of difficulty in order to do it is also high. So, you know, it, it becomes this problem of like, you know, who's going to stop it? Who's going to worry about it and, and all this other stuff, but like it happening accidentally or just like, people doing it i think it, it it's it's a high tier compared to like you know buying a ak-47 and you said before that you consider yourself a social activist so when you talk about like who's going to stop these kind of things or the regulations that we've been talking about like what is it that you feel like you are fighting for in terms of um trying to open up this domain to people <laughs> well, in terms of that sort of stuff, you know, I would not put me in charge of making any laws or rules or regulations about things, you know, like I am not the person to uh, make those because I, I'm too far in one spectrum. You know, you need somebody who's more in the middle, but like, I generally think access to knowledge and technology is a positive. We always see positives, right? And that's the crazy thing about biohacking. If you look at like any sort of technology that was made accessible or open sourced or democratized like it, it created a, a revolution an evolutionary jump in technology right you look at computers you look at the printing press you look at cars and vehicles airplanes like anything you could imagine when this technology became available to the masses it was just like boom something exploded and i think the same thing is true with biotechnology um are you going to need to have like a driver's license or stop signs or, you know, stoplights? Maybe. What are those? I don't know. But like, I think that's okay. You know, like stop signs help us from not accidentally hurting each other. I think about that with uh, the internet if I can use, use an analogy here, but like if the internet had had been restricted to like behind locked doors, you would see this very uh, oppressive regime, I think, using this insanely powerful tool to screw with people. Whereas in a way, the genie kind of got out of the bottle. You couldn't, now you can't put the internet back in this little closed container. And the fact that it's so ubiquitous and open to everybody empowers a lot of people in a way that it might yeah. not have if we were like, this is too dangerous for the average person to have. So I kind of feel like that maybe relates. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I think biotechnology is like one of the most powerful technologies that we have, right? The internet and computers and that sort of technology is really cool, but it's digital, right? It's all digital. It's all held inside our computer. Sure. You can be like, well, I can 3D print something or program a robot or something like that. But literally all the stuff on earth, all the living stuff is biological. So you're like, well, I can program living biological things, right? That's like self-replicating matter, right? You can program the seed to grow into a tree. Like what else can you program it to do? Once people have access to this technology and really understand it, like the stuff they're going to create is just going to be beyond our comprehension right now, right? Because never in the history of the earth have people been genetically modifying things. It's all been through like, 
Yeah, a UV ray hits this organism and it changes one DNA base. Does it do anything good? No, nothing happens over billions of years. It takes billions of years for just like random mutations to cause some sort of positive evolution or genetic drift. And now we can just go in and say like, I want this. I want a dragon. I'm going to try to make it, right? And people are going to make it, right? It, is, it, is it possible to make a dragon? A hundred percent. Like we know there are dinosaurs that could fly. Why can't we recreate that? Is it probable right now? Probably not because not, nobody's really working on it because you can't get a government grant or publish a paper on it probably. <laughs> How to make a dragon. Yeah. But like it's possible. And uh, having that technology, that powerful technology available to everybody, could you imagine hmm. literally a technology to control the fate of humanity, right? You can genetically engineer humans. You can genetically engineer any animal. The fate of every organism being held by very few people. Like that to me is crazy scary. Yeah. Not controlled by very few people, but I do worry in, in full honesty, like I, I would love to see this technology become very ubiquitous, but at the same time, there's a part of me that's like, this is going to screw up ecosystems, uh, you know, and like evolution did take billions of years to adapt to one another and for like bodies and brains and forms to say, okay, this zebra runs really fast. So I need to learn to run a little bit faster. The food's up here. And it, it took a, you know, a million years for that neck on the zebra to grow a little bit longer. It was like, what happens when all of a sudden you just build a, build an organism and you have a hundred of those competing on the landscape. It's like, Oh gosh, is it, is it the greatest idea or is it the most terrible idea? You know? And that's, that's always a tough question because exactly. it's like, the thing is, as humans is it's, it's hard for us to comprehend these things. Right. Mm -hmm. We didn't comprehend the effect that like the internet would have or social media, right. Or all these things and the effect that would have on us. We didn't even comprehend the effect that like, fucking smoking would have on humans right everybody thought smoking was good for your health for the longest time so we are not good at like projecting consequences for these things so you have a couple options right don't do it and just be like we're gonna outlaw it all and like not do any of it right or try to think about the future instead of thinking about now and being like all right, you know, if we want a future that's equitable, how do we make this technology safe and available to the most amount of people possible, right? And nobody's really thinking about that question. People are just like, is it good or bad now? And that's just so binary and it's so boring. It's just like, it's, it's not so simple. Like, it's not as simple as that, right? Will this technology be used bad and will it cause catastrophes? I'm sure what technology hasn't, right? Like, is there a tech, you know, cars cause like millions of deaths a year millions just so we can travel faster, faster and easier <laughs> like that's that's yeah. that's kind of creepy you know when you're just like wow you know they're the automobile god we sacrifice millions of lives just so i can like don't have to walk to the grocery store we kind of brush that stat under the rug when we talk <laughs> about these things don't we <laughs> if you think about it it's like there's that risk reward that people are thinking about whether it's subconsciously or whatever they're thinking about it. Right. And they're like, cars are fucking awesome. And like not having cars is terrible. So, you know, let's choose cars. If we are going to talk in terms of evolution, there does seem to be like an evolutionary appreciation that should take effect here, which is like cars have only been around for a very short period of time. And as the technology evolves, it's likely they'll drive themselves and yeah. not kill as many people. So maybe we will have yeah. that rough, you know, preteen, uh, angsty teenager phase of, of biohacking and gene editing. Totally. But then it will maybe find that place where it's like self-guided, nano-engineered, uh, biohacking, gene editing that prevents itself from creating harm. I don't know. Yeah, no, totally. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's sad and it sucks, but like capitalism drives these things, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about, it's like, it takes a long time for the amount of money to get put in place for us to actually develop the technology to have self-driving cars. Now we're starting to get to that place because people have the money and they're investing in it. Car companies are investing in it, um, which is great, but without that money being invested in it, it's not going to happen. And it's going to be the same thing with biotechnology, right? 
until it's cool, until it's popular and until everybody's doing it, um, our company is going to invest money in it. But at, when it gets to that time, it's going to be too late probably already, you know, and it's just going to be like, boom, you're stuck with this technology. And now what? Yeah. You know, and I, I try to talk to people in the government and stuff like that, but you know, it, it's also just like, they don't care. You know, they're, they're more interested in, you know, nuclear weapons threats and all these other things. And, you know, if uh, something really bad happens, they'll just slap a band hammer on it, you know? Yeah, I mean, the fact that we, what was it, we dismantled our pandemic response team right before the pandemic kind of shows how inept we are when it comes to things oh, like science so and technology. Dumb. It's just so dumb, right? We did so bad on, I mean, everybody in the world did so bad with this pandemic and you're just like, if this happens again and it's way worse, like we're screwed. All of us are screw <laughs> screwed, like, <laughs> gosh, as terrible as pandemic response and it, you know that's one of my arguments is like look you know I, I i i did a calculation before i went through and i figured out like how many scientists are there in the world that are actually doing like hands-on biomedical research and the number is disgustingly low it's something like uh, 1.5 million across the whole world right you're talking billions of people 1.5 million are doing hands-on biomedical research um something like that and uh, you're just like, even if biohackers are just there solely to increase the number of scientists in the world, like that would be valuable, right? Or increase the number of people with scientific education, that would be valuable, right? Not even just people who do genetic engineering or things like that. And like a million people, that's not a hard number to like double or triple, yeah. you know? I read somewhere online that there's around like, 15, 17 million hobbyist computer programmers, people who just program for fun. Yeah. You know, think if there were like 15 to 17 million, just like hobbyist scientists, biomedical scientists, you know, like the FDA approves like 60 to 70 drugs a year. And most of those are like reformulations or like they treat diseases that already have treatments. Right. And the who has uh, registered like over 30,000 diseases. Oh, wow. Right. So if we're doing like 10 drugs a year for different diseases, what is it going to be like 3000 years before we get a treatment for every disease? Like what kind of time scale is that even oh, reasonable? Yeah. yeah it, feel, it feels like in a lot of ways we would benefit so much from having the garage tinkerers and hackers and biohackers who are, you know, for every even if it's only one out of every hundred thousand of them, you know, are creating a breakthrough technology or solution that didn't exist before um, because they were able to use something like maybe a DIY kit in a garage to like learn it on their own. Yeah. It's so valuable. It, it's, I mean, at least I think it is, it's crazy. You know, a lot of the world's problems come down to a lot of it is something biological. You know, you're talking about medicine, you're talking about food, you're talking about energy, like, a lot of these things come from biological sources. And so it's like, if we can focus on biology and invest in biology, not just money, but also human hours, like I think our world is going to go so far. And when I hear you say that, I then think, why are you getting so much pushback? Why you, I feel like in a lot of ways you've, so I followed you on Facebook for a few years, I think back oh, when yeah. things were like kind of starting and I just, yeah. you know, just like kind of haphazardly watched the things that you've gone through. <laughs> and I feel like I've watched you get like demonetized and censored oh, yeah. and I've watched you get a ton of shit from uh, companies and, and a lot yeah. of really negative responses to what you're doing. Like, I guess, can you talk about what that, is like and why yeah. do you think it's happening well i think the main reason that i get a lot of pushback from governments and technology companies and all these people is because i'm doing science differently and i think that's a huge shock right so like i have a phd i worked at nasa i i have published scientific papers in very reputable journals good science you know i've spoken at you know famous scientific conferences and all these things but the way I present science is, is different because I'm not trying to speak to other scientists. I'm trying to speak to people because I want people to know what's possible. So like the way I present 
present my science tends to be a little more dramatic. It tends to be a little more um, interesting, entertaining, all these things that science isn't supposed to be. So what ends up happening is I get lumped in these categories of like, that's probably not real or that guy's crazy because like, that's not how mainstream science should be, right? It should be some boring person, you know, who's wearing a, a tie and some lab coat and glasses and, you know, and, and that's not me. And so I think that's one of the reasons. And I think the other thing is just that like people don't understand it, you know, people don't understand what I'm doing. And so they have immediate like lash. They're just like, that's crazy. And you're just like, well, why, you know, people shouldn't be able to do that. Well, why, you know, and it's just because like, it's so outside people's realm of like, what is normal and what is acceptable that they're not ready for it yet. And more and more people are though, more and more people are like, you know, that is interesting. Maybe we should support that. Maybe we should be involved in that stuff. But I think right now it's still, you know, I remember this interview, it was like on Dateline or something like that. Um, I didn't actually see the live interview. I, I somehow stumbled upon this YouTube video when I was in a YouTube hole, you know? And uh, it was like Steve Jobs on Dateline um, debating some guy about whether people should have personal computers. And nowadays we think that's crazy. Yeah. You know, like who would argue against people having personal computers? You know, but there was some person who is arguing against people having personal computers and you're just like holy cow like a lot of times when there's new technology it goes through phases you know people are fearful of it and scared because it's unknown and then people start to warm up to it right and then it becomes ubiquitous and mm -hmm. so i think we're still in that phase where like people don't understand it enough so they're they're fearful they're hesitant of it um yeah they're scared of it but i also feel there's like a a natural incl inclination towards that too. Cause as I'm thinking while you're saying that I'm thinking about the fact that I've just did like a gut biome test where I could get custom made enzymes to my like microbiome. I have like a watch that helps me monitor my sleep stuff. And there's all these other little things that I do with like vitamins after I drink yeah. alcohol and all this stuff. And I'm constantly trying to figure out how to make myself feel the best because I know myself better than anybody 100%. else and when i go into a traditional system when i go into the hospital or a doctor's office i get these really kind of like standardized responses that honestly make me feel kind of like cattle in a system and i and i feel like they are just way off mark like they think they, they don't they don't care or it's they're not listening or i don't have time to explain and i feel like we i feel like people want to take that control over their own their own health and their biology because they know it better than anyone else and somebody else just doesn't care as much like it's just, oh yeah for you know natural reasons somebody is just not going to care as much as you care oh 100 percent. you know I, I i went to this doctor and i told them i one of the medications that they prescribed me was you know giving me side effects and they were like no that's not a side effect of that medication or something like that and i'm like wait you're telling me that what I feel is wrong with no, based on nothing, right? Like just based on your opinion, that's crazy. I, you know, even if it was just my opinion, I think you'd like at least try to listen to it and take it into account. Mm -hmm. Later, I went and looked it up and it is a side effect in a small proportion of the population. It's just a small proportion of the population, but you know, you're just like, oh gosh, like, yeah, these people are way off and it hurts. It like mm -hmm. literally hurts people. So what's your focus now? I know we're coming up on time here, but uh, wh 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 where where is your energy invested now? What What is the fight that you think needs to happen? Are you still wanting to fight for this? Like, Oh yeah, no, I mean, I, right now I'm, you know, my ultimate goal is, uh, my ultimate, ultimate goal is always just to create a dragon. Um, both, <laughs> you know, facetiously and also, um, like for real, um, because I think it's the epitome of like pointless science. Um, you know, it's just like, do, does the dragon have any usefulness in the world? No, like probably not. Right. Um, but it's just be super cool and everybody would want one. Um, 
So what we've started to push for is working, doing uh, embryo genetic modification. So we recently set up our own uh, micro injection rig uh, where we can stick tiny needles into embryos of different organisms and inject them with DNA and other things to genetically modify them. Cause like we were talking about earlier, adults, though you can modify them, it's really hard, but if you can inject and modify at like the six cell stage or eight cell stage or something like that, at worst, you're like, you know, one in eight cells in the body is modified, mm-hmm. right? Which is huge. Amazing. Yeah. That's huge. That's like way more than you'll probably ever need. Right. At, at best, you're probably like 50% of the cells in the body are modified. Right. So if you want to do like serious body changes, you can do crazy stuff and people have, right. Mm-hmm. You can grow extra limbs and do all this stuff that like people imagine and dream, but you have to be able to set up a micro injection rig, which is like, it's not easy. Most people don't have the knowledge or like skill to be able to set up something like that or work with something like that. So we're trying to, we have set up a rig. We're trying to, to develop a guide to teach other people how to set up rigs similarly, because like, to me, I want biohackers to be what everybody hate follows them to be. And that's like engineering organisms in their garage that like are crazy as shit. You know, it's like Pokemon every day. It was just like, Oh gosh. Why is there this weird organism walking down the street? Somebody, somebody must have done something crazy. You know, that's the kind of world I want to live in. Uh, and when you say we, is that your company with the Odin? Yeah, it's my company um, and the other biohackers and scientists who work who, who work there. Um, Speaking of which, uh, what is the best way for people to find your work and kind of the stuff that you're putting out there if they want to follow you? Yeah, I mean, I'm on all the social medias, you know, Instagram, it's just Jay Zayner and Twitter is for love of science. You could follow me, just search me on the internet and I'm sure you'll be able to find me. Just don't read any of the news articles. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, Josiah, man, I really want to thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate this conversation and uh, we'll include links to all of this stuff. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. No, I mean, it was good. Yeah, I got to talk about all the crazy stuff, you know. That's always good.